to go. Thank you very much everyone for coming. Um, this is a welcome to what Insights Chats 01, so the first of a series of chats. Um, I'm Chess, I'll be co-presenting, our co-hosting with Marin uh, today to interview the lovely Alice on all things Insight and what it's been like in the Insights industry. Um, so to get started, I suppose the first question is a bit of an intro of your background, what brought you into Insights and yeah, how you started your career really. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I feel like I'm quite similar to a lot of researchers in the room potentially in that I'm just kind of the nosy. I'm very fascinated by people, I'm very curious, um, and that's why I studied social anthropology um, at university. And whilst I was studying there, there was actually um, an alumni come and he did a chat with us, with us final year um, anthropology students. He was working as an insight manager at Nestle at the time, um, and I had no idea what I was going to do with social anthropology. I knew I wanted to do something that would help me sort of pursue my passion in understanding people and doing a bit of research, but I had no idea what that would look like. Um, and then, yeah, he came in, spoke to us and talked about insight as a career. And I was like, oh, light bulb. Um, and yeah, I guess I owe my career to him. I don't know wherever he is, some guy at Nestle, thank you <laughs> for giving me that idea. He might see um, you on this and yeah, you can just yeah, tell him no, thanks. Like, yeah. Cheers for that, by the way. Who, who knows where I'd be without that discussion? Maybe I'd have ended up in insight, I don't know. But um, yeah, so when I graduated, um, I was looking for insight roles. I didn't know at the time the difference between, you know, working client side or research agency side or media agency side. I, I just wanted to work as an insight, someone in insight or research. And so um, I became a um, graduate insight executive at OMD UK, which is a media agency. Some of you might have heard of them, maybe not. Um, and yeah, I was there for about five years. It's kind of where I first cut my teeth on all things research. I think an agency is a, quite a good environment to sort of harden you up to fast-paced life. I don't know who else works in marketing agencies, but you probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and then in June 2021, I joined Have Ice People, um, and that's an employee branding and um, talent communications agency, so slightly different focus. Um, and really, my role there is to kind of upskill um, the insight capability across the agency. We're a much smaller agency than OMD UK, um, so there's a bit of a need to sort of upskill people in, in their insight capabilities. Um, and yeah, it's been really interesting just moving from sort of more consumer, sort of media facing insights to yeah, global employer brands targeting professional audiences and employees um, and doing a lot more qualitative research uh, rather than quant. Um, and yeah, a lot of the research is for helping kind of create communications, but also with our sort of media and channel, channel strategy as well. Um, but ultimately still doing lots of research at the core, which is what I love and what I want to continue to do. So. Yeah, that's a little bit about me so far. Ah. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, and so, what kind of research do you do? You actually love to 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 do, and why? Um, well, actually, we were just talking about this when we chess because um, I think I've realised that I'm a proper quali at heart. At the end of the day, sorry to everyone that loves their quant through and through. I can see the value, and I love doing a bit of both. But I think I've realised that I'm yeah definitely more of a qualitative research fan. Um, I feel like it's probably a bit old school now to say that I love, you know, the focus groups, the in-depth interviews, because there's so many different ways of researching audiences now, but for me, just the basic way of talking to people one-on-one -on -one or as a group, either in person or online, I just think is so valuable still. Um, maybe it's a bit old school now, who knows, but um, yeah, that's always been my sort of preferred methodology, but I do love it when a project can combine both qualitative methods, you know, focus groups and interviews, as well as surveys, because you know, you can look more behind the why behind the what. It's that cliche of just understanding more in depth what people are actually thinking and feeling and believing. Um, so that's more like the methodology. And then when it comes to, I guess, the sort of the purpose of the research that I like to do, obviously coming from a more like media kind of marketing communications background, for me, I'm really interested in understanding, I guess, what drives like brand perceptions and people's feelings and associations towards brands and also their communication needs, it's kind of all I've ever researched, so it's, it's an interest for me. Um, but I guess importantly, it's not just, you know, where are they consuming media, what do they think about the brand, but it's like trying to unco un like, um, uncover their underlying kind of attitudes and behaviours and drivers, which is always a challenge in research, because people say one thing and do another, obviously, but like, if you can try and, I guess, get more to the, uh, under their skin, I think it, that's where the combination of qualitative and quantitative research can be really helpful. Um, so, for example, in my world, it might be your survey tells you that, you know, a high proportion of people don't trust your brand or they associate you with, you know, some negative things, for example. 
then you want to understand well what's driving that perception and what's what's why why do people not trust us what can we do to help change that or how can we shape their perception and that's where I guess the qualitative research comes in because you can ask them look we've talked to thousands of people we know this is the case but you can tell us now why is it and what's driving that and then hopefully you know you can re produce a report that helps to fix it in some way um, so yeah a bit of the methodology okay. I like and the kind of the, the type of research I like to and do. what do you think uh, and is and is there and is there from your from your point of view better to do first qual and then quant or like first quant then qual really good question actually um, I was talking to a few people earlier about this um, I think what can be really nice is using qual at the early stage of a research project um, as I said to sort of uncover some of those underlying beliefs and perceptions of something and then I guess quantifying it on a larger scale and getting the numbers behind the findings because clients get a bit wary of quantitative research it's like we spoke to 20 people oh that's not relevant that's not representative which I understand I get that um, so you know you can kind of reassure them by saying yeah we use that to inform the survey and the survey told us that you know x percent of people feel the same way so but it can also work the other way it can be like okay I've, I've got some results in the survey but there's some gaps in the knowledge and we don't really understand why we're seeing what we're seeing and that's where I think Qual can also supplement the findings from a, from a quant survey so okay. it can work both ways I think. Yeah multi-methods is good because you've got the you, you've got to combine the depth with the breadth of information so I'm the same absolutely all for the Qual because you can get numbers from anywhere it's fine. <laughs> Um, I'm joking. I'm joking for anybody who loves quant. You, you don't have to. <laughs> but yeah, the richness of it is it adds to that. So the two really do complement one another. The two together is perfect. Um, so obviously you talked around the background and what kind of research you're into and stuff like that. I suppose in terms of when you've completed a piece of research and then it's a mass. It's the role. It's the job of then having to translate that into a story for the mm -hmm. client or in whatever way that might be. Mm -hmm. Have you found that there's anything that clients particularly p underestimate or um, pay le like less attention to than in terms of the findings that you do present to them? Really, yeah, that's really, I really like that question actually. Um, well, in my world in employer branding and employer marketing, um, so obviously what we're trying to do is market a company or an employer to potential candidates um, to attract more talent into the business. So it's not marketing a product like a you know fast moving goods thing or whatever it's more like how can we make this company attractive and I find in the work a lot of people are obsessed with um, you know what are our competitors saying like what, 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 what are they saying in market and how can we be different or what do the senior leaders think of the company what's their vision and ambition um, or what does external talent think of us like what's their brand perception of us and in all of that sometimes the actual employee voice can get a bit lost um, and I think it's just a learning in general, um, you know, for researchers in, in any field. It's like, you know, it's important to look outside at market trends or what your competitors are saying, um, you know, or what your brand is offering. But you don't want to forget at the end of the day who your end user is or your target audience and what do they believe and think and feel and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, sometimes in the work that I'm doing now, um, especially that sort of senior leader view, a lot of the time that gets prioritised over what the actual employees think. Um, so yeah, I guess when I'm writing up research proposals and that sort of thing, um, I often try and I just look at what the research need is and go, okay, well, we're getting some answers from looking at the market trends, we're looking at competitors, but then, you know, trying to factor in how we're going to get that employee voice as well, like just making sure that's implemented in the research because it's like ultimately, if you're going to go out to market with an employer brand or a recruitment campaign um, and you're just spilling off what your competitors are saying or spilling off what the senior leaders are saying, you might not be capturing what the reality is at the company. So, yeah, yeah sometimes that happens uh, in my field of work anyway. And it's quite annoying. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't lose sight of actually what's yeah. going to happen at the end of it. Yeah. yeah, who the real user is ultimately. So, Definitely. Yeah, and I'm sure it happens in lots of other fields of research too. Okay, yeah, great. And, uh, what, and what do you do when you came with uncertain, in, uh, with uncertain insight and clients say, and it's actually the, it's actually the, the opposite thing of what clients think that it's going to be and how do they react to it when you are saying certain in certain in certain insights that are going against their like uh, way of purse of, of how the things should be and how do you react on that and as, as, as well um, yeah yeah that can happen <laughs> um, and I think anyone working, you know, agency side will come across clients who sometimes don't like what they see or they don't quite trust the data because maybe it goes against what they believe about the brand or what 
they would like to believe about the brand. Um, I don't encounter it that often, um, and I think you know if you go in with an open mind when you're presenting research findings, um, and you know you might not be able to think what what am I going to get resistance on exactly? Like what are they going to challenge? Which if you can if you can anticipate that, then you can think of a response. But if not, I think just try and go in with an open mind and expect some pushback in some places. And you know I've got a bit more hardened to that now where. I might get challenged or pushed back occasionally because it's happened a few times before. Um, and I think also what's helpful in those situations is to reassure the client, maybe just talking through the, the process and the methodology that you took to get to those insights and how you drew, drew those conclusions and just having full transparency to say that this is what the data tells us and this is what the research is showing and um, this is why we've drawn the conclusions that we've drawn and just, I guess, giving them some confidence in the numbers, if you're using numbers, or you know, in the qualitative data, if you're doing qual, and reassuring them in any way that you can um, that's obviously suitable to the relationship that you have with the client. Um, and I think what's key in all of this is if there's something which they're now seeing as a problem or a challenge, come to, come to them with a solution and offer up you know, a learning or an action to be had off the back of that, because you don't want to be seen as, oh, that, was, that researcher just told us what was our issues and what our problems was. They just you know, presented a load of issues for us and now we've got to deal with that. It's like, you know, they came to us, they identified a problem and they've also, you know, offered up a way to hopefully solve that problem or at least suggested a way to solve it, depending on how big and <laughs> how big the problem is. But yeah, so I guess just showing them the process, reassuring them and yeah, uh, reassuring them there's an action learning to be had at the back of it, you know, giving them something to use in the future, potentially. <laughs> yeah, it's important to make sure that the integrity of the research is standing. I've had, gosh, I won't name a name, but I remember years ago a client once said that they wanted to go a particular way with something and then the, the data said something different and they asked us to send them the raw data oh. to, to, ch to change the raw data. I think, no, but you had to, of course, try and say that in a way, in a polite way. They're still a client, you still, you know, you have to protect the relationship, but at the same time, you don't want to mislead your, your duties to, the, to portraying the insights in the best possible way and, and making sure that's accurate, so you don't want to mix that up in any way. Um, so that's obviously the client side. Switching that to an internal thing, um, have you ever, obviously, you understand the importance, the, the value of insights. Do you ever have to, do you ever feel like you have to sell the process of insights internally? Like, do you ever, are you ever up against anything inside the businesses you're working in? Yeah, I think the problem, and I've come across this in, you know, working in media agencies and marketing agencies, is that people see the value of the research, but sometimes uh, the purpose of it gets a bit lost. So uh, rather than using it to generate ideas or, you know, come up with a new strategy or a campaign, people come up with an idea, they get the client to buy in on it, and then they go, right, we need to get some insights to back up the idea or whatever it is we've come up with. Um, that happens too often, actually, <laughs> where, um, you know, or today, actually, it happened where, um, basically, we tried to implement some creative testing with the client early on with the research proposal, um, but, you know, they said, we don't need it, it's fine. They've gone ahead, they've paid for, you know, the creative team to work something up nice, and. Um, now, basically, the, the client that we're working with is anxious that other senior stakeholders, their side, are going to come in and go, well, where's the research to back it up? So now they're asking us to basically create some research that backs up the creative, um, which obviously is retrospective. It's not the right way to do it. Um, but it does happen quite a lot where it's like, you know, it's kind of bolted on at the end to back up an idea rather than used to generate something at the start, Yeah. Um, which is frustrating. <laughs> yeah, you can't retrofit uh, insight to answer yeah, a question, that's not the role exactly of it. Exactly that, yeah. and it's like, well, yeah, you're in a bit of a sticky situation, and yeah, I think in those, when that happens, I guess, you know, if I'm talking to the project managers or I'm talking to the client, it's like, look, we can see the issue that we, we've now, that's now arisen, it's obviously not the right way to do things because, you know, the insight is kind of futile because it's just going to back up what we're doing, um, and I guess it's just communicating the issues with that and trying to help them see why that's not useful, not in a way that's like, they're still coming to me for research, which is good. Like, I'm glad that they're talking about research. I don't want to put someone off and say, hey, you're doing it the wrong way. But just saying, next time, let's try and implement this at the beginning or yeah. earlier on or throughout the process. Because, yeah, it's just a bit frustrating when it happens right at the end, just to back something up. Yeah, and it's where the most value is. If you can be insight-led, that's the best thing in terms of an output as a solution. Yeah, agreed. Of course, so the, res the research should be grounds, gr grounds and then build up uh, upon that. So how do you handle uh, clients like that? How do you handle the most the 
most difficult clients or the or those who wants just back my idea mm. with your research and I need just that. So how do you? Oh, how, how uh, I just tell them to leave. No, okay. <laughs> um, leave the building. Not, right? Yeah, well, we don't need your money. No, <laughs> <kidding. laughs> come back. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, um, no, no. Um, I think yeah. In those situations, it obviously depends. Like yeah, there's a few different ways clients can sometimes be quite tricky. Either it's they don't quite agree with the findings, they don't trust the findings, or sometimes it's like there's too many stakeholders suddenly getting involved, so the scope of the research changes, and all of a sudden, you know, it's different from what it was when you started. Or you have the opposite problem, and sometimes, you know, there's too little client engagement, or there's not enough momentum client side, and that's also a problem as well. Um, and I guess there's two different ways I deal I deal with each of those situations separately. Um, so firstly, dealing with clients who, yeah, maybe. You know, they don't quite like the findings, or there's too many of them getting involved. I think, I think it's important to be seen as like a researcher, but also a kind of a consultant at the same time. So, I guess you know, if the client is suggesting something that's not going to help, it's like you have the confidence to say, "Don't waste your budget. You know, put it elsewhere because this isn't actually a good way of spending your money, and it's mm -hmm. not going to help us either." Yeah. Um, and I guess just being confident in offering that advice based on your you know, your skills and your experiences and your capabilities. And then you become more than a researcher, but like a trusted advisor, hopefully. Um, and then I think if you can move your relationship into one that's more like that, then you're less likely to maybe encounter difficulties or questions because you've, ha you've, you've built up that trust. It's not always easy, but I think that's one way to sort of, I guess, counter some of those issues. Um, and then for the other problem, like, I guess for clients who are not so engaged or maybe not as interested in, in what we're doing. Obviously you can have like interim check-ins and sort of calls with them and keeping them up to date with how it's going. But I think I found what's quite helpful when they're losing interest or they're, they're not seeing the value in it is, there's a few things. I think just simplicity sometimes is really key, like not overwhelming them with like a 70 page research deck because they're not gonna read it. And sometimes there's a real habit to, to produce those sorts of overly detailed, overly heavy presentations. So I think, coming to the client with really simple, straightforward conclusions and like visual presentations and reports that are exciting and inspiring and not like really overwhelming and confusing, but also really importantly is showing, helping them see the value of the research by, I guess, demonstrating how it's going to help them reach like a key business decision. Like ultimately they want to know from a business point of view, what, what's the impact going to be for me? What does this mean for me? And how is it going to help me make a key decision basically internally? So even if they don't see anything, if that's up at the top as a one-page slider, <laughs> then that will help, I yeah. think, with those people who are just not really that interested or don't see the value of it. Hopefully. Yeah. And if they're still not interested, then fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fuck them all. Um, no, I think, I think the point on... <laughs> I think the point on trust is a really good one. Um, yeah, no, the point on trust is a really, really good one. Obviously, you're, you're doing insights and you're delivering this, and they're, like you say, they're ultimately going to make a decision off the back of it. So you, the whole point you're talking earlier around the integrity of the research and making sure you're true to the information and not inferring anything that's not based in the information you've shown them, but equally having that partnership, because it is a partnership mm -hmm. a lot of the time. A lot, you know, a lot of agencies and clients work together for years on end because they then tr have the trust in that relationship to do exactly what you say. So I think that's really important, absolutely. Um, do you see a question now? What is the most annoying thing? So what's really annoying about your job? What's really annoying working with clients? If you've got a really annoying client story, even better. But just what's really annoying? <laughs> I'm not going to name and shame. <laughs> <laughs> no names, no. no. Um, yeah. I think, I don't know, I feel like we probably dis discuss like quite a few issues sometimes working with clients, but and how you can get, help get around that, like, you know, not seeing the value or maybe, you know, not trusting the data um, or, you know, not, yeah, not being engaged. Um, I think, like, what, what can be really annoying, and this is kind of boring, but if you're a researcher like me, you'll, you'll completely understand, it's just like a really vague shit brief is really annoying because they'll just come to you and go, we need to know this now. And it's like, what? With no background information, yeah. no context, no deadline, no audience, no budget. It's like, <laughs> okay, take a step back. And, that, that and then they want to know it all with no budget yeah. still. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's, that happens all the time and it's really annoying. Um, and I guess it's just like just being, again, going back to that kind of consultant advisory role where it's like taking the time to communicate and, and consult with whoever's come with you with the brief to go, you know, 
not being, oh, sometimes I'm not as nice as this, but you know, just saying, okay, where did this brief come from? Like, what's the background to it? What's the context? Why is the client asking for this? Um, and just like really pointed questions like, what's the primary goal of the research? Um, what information is needed to reach that goal? What's the key business decision that needs to happen off the back of the research? Um, and then all the other stuff like, you know, what's the budget? What's the timeline? Tomorrow, no money. <laughs> and like target audience, obviously all of that. But I think key when you've got really rubbish, like vague brief is nailing down the research objectives and the aims of the research right at the start so that, you know, there's no confusion or, you know, um, issues at the end of the project when it's not being met. Um, but yeah, that to be honest, it's, it's not as interesting or juicy as like a client story, but shit briefs is a really big part of my job, and it's really annoying. <laughs> yeah, the brief, no, the briefing process is is almost an indicator of the output of the work. So if you've got a great brief, you can design research and the approach for that accordingly. If you've got a terrible brief, then you have to work that out yourself, and actually, you need the research questions up front. Otherwise, mm. what Any are you testing for? What are you looking for? Yeah, exactly. Anyone that did the MRS, I don't know if this is like too niche, but the MRS, like Market Research Society. Um, they, they do like a certificate and like that is just drilled into you. It's like get the research brief nailed down and everything else follows. Yeah. So yeah, get your research brief right. <laughs> <laughs> How often do you like, mm, do you get a great brief? Is that a, a common thing or a rare thing? Pre, pretty rare, um, I would say. I think it's helped now that I've, I've kind of like created a template for, for where I'm at now in my agency I've got like an okay. insight brief template and, and then you send it to them yeah. yeah and now it's just easy accessible easily accessible so it's like what like what's the background and the context to this you know where's it coming from what's the client challenge you know what's the primary goal of the research what do okay. I need to find out um, what's the budget what's the timeline <laughs> all of that what's the audience has there been any research previously and just laying it all out so it's all there and it often means that like whoever's come with the brief has to go well, we know none of this so we have to go back to the client and actually ask some proper questions. And then hopefully some of these client service teams or planners, whoever it is that takes the brief, is confident to ask the questions without the template. And they, the client comes to them and says, we've got this gap in knowledge, we need to do some research. And then instead of having to you know, either come up with some weird brief or look at my template, they already know some of those key questions that's gonna get to like a more defined brief, hopefully, one day. <laughs> okay, and really, uh, for me, I think that's also an uh, important one. Do you, uh, tell to your clients that they need to fill the brief or you fill the brief for, for, for them? Um, we would normally, we would, we would keep the brief like internally okay. and then use that to like guide our questions with the client. Okay. Um, so yeah, basically it's like they would, sometimes the client might you know, have conversations with our client service teams or client partners. So from the, then, from the converse, from the converse, from the conversations. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then they can use it as a reference point. And this, they, yeah. they well, I would see. use it as a reference point, you know, going okay. back to it. Yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. Well, maybe we could start sending it to clients. I don't know. I feel like that's a bit. Just send it to them. You know, <laughs> feel, like feel, feel like feel this. Is, no, be, 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 because I really think when you write something down, it actually forces you to think more. And it's a different thing when someone asks you, and when you are right, and when you are asked, when you are writing the things down by yourself, mm. you need to think more. And I don't know because a lot of times the uh, client can come and say, so the primary goal is this, but uh, actually a great thing would be if we can get also this, and the Joe from the actually wants to know this as well, and maybe you know, so it can really expand. And maybe if we just take a step back and ask them, okay, well, what's just the one prime, 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 primary goal of the research would be really great. <laughs> okay. Uh, so how, how the, from your point of view, industry changed in the last five years? Oh, I feel like you could probably go down so many rabbit holes with that question. <laughs> okay. um, but I'm just going to go down my little traditional coal route because that's what yeah, I Yeah, fly, the, I fly the coal flag. <laughs> um, and it's an obvious one, but obviously the pandemic has shifted like online methods of research like exponentially, as it has with every, lots of other things, um, which is really great. Like a lot more people are tech savvy now and comfortable, you know, being online. And I think from a logistical point of view, running research, especially if you want to do qual, is a bit more accessible for clients now because it costs a bit less to talk to global audiences. It's a bit quicker. You're not sending researchers out to different markets, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that's good logistically and also it's allowing some interesting 
trends in sort of engaging people in research. So like you might have heard of like Menti and Mural and stuff and these sort of more online interactive tools which I've been using a little bit here and there. It's been really interesting like getting people kind of voting in, in the session in a focus group which almost makes it quite quanty as well. Um, or getting them to like workshop something during the session so it's a little bit more engaging you using something like Mural or something. Um, so yeah, I, just from my own experience from doing a lot of qual research recently, I just think like that the online habits and like the online like focus groups has been a massive change for me and I love it. Obviously it doesn't completely detract from face to face groups we were talking about this earlier. Um, I think sometimes there's a real value in doing stuff in person. It obviously depends on what the research brief is and if they want to ship me out somewhere nice then I'll take that. Um, but yeah, I think that's like a huge change. But I think probably a lot of people here would have a much more exciting and interesting answer to that question. <laughs> no, I, they, all of the tools that have come into Qual in the last few years have yeah. been, yeah, they've really carried, like, gone a lot faster and it's probably exacerbated through Covid they had to go faster because you couldn't do the in-person research and research still had to happen so what's really great is when you can create a platform that's quant and qualed and it's all you know hosted online you can get all that rich data and all that quantifiable evidence to support it so 100% agree on the tools and um, before we open up to questions we're going to open up to questions if anybody has anything but last question um, what would you suggest what any advice for anybody trying to get into the insights industry, any hot tips that they can they can bear in mind? Um, well, I mean, you know, chat to some guy at Nestle and then you're set. No, oh, um, other than that, yeah. <laughs> um, I think, like, this is a cliche, like, piece of advice for people in insights, because, I don't know, people will probably hear this all the time, but it's like, just always think about the so what when you're doing anything, like, you know, you've got the data, but how can you make it useful and how can you turn it into knowledge for the client? Um, and just always think about what the implications are for whoever it is that's you know commissioned the research. Like thinking about their wider business context is really key because otherwise it just doesn't get used. It's not interesting and people won't use it. Um, and yeah, I guess in short, think of the think of like the wider context and the business challenge and what the outcomes are for the client. Um, yeah, the so what basically, which has been touted loads to me over the years. I don't know if anyone else has had that told to them, but. Yeah, it's always important, especially if you want that client engagement and you want people to use you again and see the value of the research. They need to see how it's going to help them make that business decision, as I said before. So that would be my key piece of advice, I guess. No, definitely. So what? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what? what? Oh, well, it's just research for research sake, which I love, but a lot of people don't. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then you say from that trust perspective, from making a client want to you know, f treat as a partnership, it's not just a matter of, we've done the work, here are the results. It's actually working out the implications, working out what that means to their business and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. no, that, the so what is a good, is a good <laughs> ender. Um, yeah, so questions. questions do we have? Hi. Hi. Thank, thanks for that. No That's worries. So interesting. So, to understand, that that's assume you get a great client brief. What's the framework, or let's call it, what are the steps for you to deliver a great project? How do you Ooh. usually approach it? Especially, what's your ideation stage like? Um, well, yeah, I guess I would take all of that information, and if I've got a really clear idea of, you know, what it is they hope to achieve with the research, and um, what it is that the goal of the research is, then. I can understand like the information that's needed to reach that goal like and once I know what kind of information is needed that's how I design okay well if we need this information what method is right so like would a survey be the best place to find out how many people have these associated with the brand or trust the brand or would qualitative research be better because it's more about people's like real experiences and day-to-day -day life um, so yeah I basically just use that to inform my thinking around what the best methodology would be um, and what the type of questions would be because it's really key because if I know what we need to find out then I can guide my questions in the right way and create the right discussion guide or questionnaire or that kind of thing and then then it goes out to market and you know you get the results back and then it's the whole thing of like analyzing it and telling a story um, which is a whole other thing I feel like you could probably do a whole other insights thing on just how to tell a story in the data and I don't know if I'm any Save expert on it but yeah <laughs> get someone who's an expert in storytelling um, but yeah then it's just collating all of that and I guess again that's where the research brief is handy even at the even at the end when you're um, putting a report together because you've got a clear idea of what they expect the outcome to be and what the decision needs to be you can then create a report that's curated to answer that question. And as I said, 
if you can have like one slide, because there will be people who just go, I'm not reading this, I just need to know key information at the top, and you go, well, this is your objective, um, and this is how this is answered that objective, and this is what you need to do next, and just like give it to them in one slide, and you keep some people happy that way. So that's the rough process, I guess. I hope that answered your question. I don't know if it did. So <laughs> no what do you put on that one slide? If you can put just one slide from the, from the research, what would be? What would be on that side? Uh, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it depends. I, I think I kind of touched on it there. I guess it's like, right, what did we hope to achieve with the okay. research? What was the key finding? And what's the next step? Okay, so three things. Oh, yeah. Well. You know. uh, that sounds good. I should do that. Yeah, do that right now. <laughs> <Just send it. laughs> yeah, Make some notes. <laughs> and how do you usually, so when a client comes and when you, and when you speak with them, and if you feel that someone uh, likes more to do a call or quant, are you going to adjust your advice to them? Should, should they do call or quant, or you are going by your own, by your own, in, by your own, in, by your own instinct? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I do what I want to do. No, okay. <laughs> um, no, it's just like if Goodbye. I screw that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just knowing, you know, I've been in the industry like six years, not not loads of time, but. It's enough to sort of know, based on the research brief, what we need to find out, like what the most suitable methodology is. Um, and you know, like I said, there's a lot of nervousness around qual because it doesn't give you the numbers sometimes yeah, yeah. that people want to see, and that takes a bit of work reassuring people about the value. Um, but I will still push, you know, fly the flag yeah. when I can. Um, and you know, if ultimately the client's really dead set on a certain approach, then of course we can factor it in. But if I still think, okay, on top of that we should do this element that I would try, try and push for that ultimately. Okay. I think that's the best thing. They're ultimately, the client's coming to you as the expert to advise them on what to do. So if you were to Supposedly. then, <laughs> hopefully, you can hope. Um, if you were then to turn around and say, oh, now out with that, we can do whatever you fancy, and they're not necessarily the expert to decide that, because we all know we're not always dealing um, on the client side with insight people on the other end. We might be dealing with marketeers, or we might be dealing with another element um, that aren't necessarily as clued up on the insight process. So you have to really stand your ground in what is going to get them the answers they're seeking. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Don't have any more questions? OK. So he was first uh, about you, you are yeah. in the queue, so. <laughs> 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 Can you jump in? <laughs> OK. All right, so slightly different angle. Um, so I think we understand the core aspect. But what does two-parter, so how does what does quant look like at Habas? What data sources do you use there? And you mentioned earlier that you mar you try to marry up qual and quant. So what is your approach to doing that? Yeah, great question. Um, so quant and Habas people, we there's two methods we use. So we survey being the main one, but also we have access to um, GWI. So it's like a large database. Um, some of you might use it. I don't know. Um, and that goes out. That's a survey that goes out quarterly to hundreds of thousands of people, basically. Um, obviously it's third party data so it's a bit limited, um, we can't always get the specific audience or the specific questions that we're interested in, um, but yeah, so it's either our own survey or using third party data like GWI, um, and then Qual is typically focus groups or in-depth interviews online, um, and then to mix the two it would be a survey and focus groups basically, that's, that's kind of how it would be combined I guess. Does that answer your question? Yeah, obviously, you, you don't use any available data sources, that, that, let's say Twitter, Firehose, other data sources? We actually, we do have access to Brandwatch, which is the yeah. social listening tool, but because we're targeting employees and like professional audiences, it's not always that helpful for the world that we're operating in. Um, not many people tweet about, you know, their working day or the company that they work at. Um, so yes, we do have access to that sort of data, but it's not always that helpful for what we're trying to find out. We want to understand like, employee needs and, and what candidates seek from new employers and stuff and sometimes yeah the social listening stuff doesn't always get to get that for us which is I'm, I'm surprised you don't scrape glass door and yeah yes we do use glass door reviews. sorry yeah <laughs> yeah we definitely do that um, we look at the places that people leave reviews that's a very helpful um, tool for us so yeah we look out like around at a glass door definitely um, yeah that's a really helpful tool for us sometimes that's a nice way of seeing the reality versus what other people are telling us that we're working with so yeah yeah great and how do you try to marry that data up um so we i guess we would include it in the final whatever report that we, if we if we're building an employer brand 
um, we'll obviously bring bring to the client his different sources of information that we use, um, and we'll you know we'll show them this is what employees say, this is what your reviews say, this is what your senior leaders say, and ultimately this is what your proposition should be. So yeah, we just combine it with all the other sources ultimately to say make a suggestion basically. Um, but we try not to shy away from the glass door because they need to know if people say you're shit, then we can't go out and say you're great. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't ask if I could swear before this. No. Okay. Well, let's hope you you're can. So it's a bit so late now. So we can swear. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's a great use of vocabulary. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, so speaking on trends, I think one of the challenges is the expectations, particularly when it comes to sort of like increasing expectations, sort of a race to the bottom in kind of terms of budgets and audiences and quickness of that. And how do you sort of re uh, challenge that of? We, can you reach this? Can you reach this very target budget for like five hundred pounds? Sort of it's a very target audience and that sort of thing, which is sort of an industry-wide phenomenon that people mm -hmm. expect to be able to reach this niche for incredibly cheaply. Yeah. Oh my God. Always. That's always the problem, isn't it? It's like we need to talk to these. Like, there's like they represent like one percent of the population. Um, so can we do it for yeah two hundred pounds? It's so annoying. It happens all the time. And um, yeah, again, it's just going back to what we were saying about being that partner and being that consultant and just, I guess, taking them through explaining why it costs so much and what you know what CPI means and how much of the population it actually represents and how much of that population are on a panel, which is what people don't realise. It's like, oh yeah, but you know, we know that this many people exist in the country or the market, wherever it is, but how many people are actually going to be reached, you know, how many people are targetable and um, I think yeah, it's it's a constant struggle and it's just having that transparent conversation to explain what the process is. Um, and how people, you know, how you reach people, because I think a lot of the confusion comes from not understanding the process, maybe, and not understanding what you need to do to reach those people. So if you can try and shed light on that, then that kind of helps, I think, maybe. And the, and the, and I think the thing with it is because it, it's also it's, you get what you pay for. Mm. Yeah, we can make it. You can do it for what the price you need to. We can do something with that. But the quality of the insight you're going to get off the back of it is going to be very representative of what you can put in. And I do think that's sometimes, like you say, with understanding the process, makes it a little bit harder with qualitative, with with quantitative. It's a, it's it's trusted. It's, it's rigorous. It's numbers. You've got thousands of people behind it. And so there's just something, you know, a percentage sign is somehow more trusted yeah. um, in that sense. But with quality, it's it's the depth and it's the detail and all of that sort of thing. So both are difficult and both will try and bring you down, whereas um, in terms of price, but one is a bit easier because it's more tangible to sort of explain why it costs what it is. Mm. But for something qualitative, I do find that sometimes it's more, you can't hold on to it as easily. So it's a bit harder to try and yeah. explain why it is that way. Yeah, yeah. that's true. I was going to say, like, in that sense, would you say that the parts of the pandemic have had like maybe a positive effect on the way that people perceive qualitative data? Because then you can get that budget to stretch a bit further by not having people go out in person, or like the amount the reach that you can have on like a, for one person to how many people they could reach. Yeah. Does that maybe like had a positive impact yeah. on quantitative data? Like, what kind of impact? Yeah, I think it's definitely opened up people's willingness to use it because they realise it's not going to take five weeks to reach this many people and to send a researcher out. It's actually going to take a few days to talk from people from all over the world. So it's like, yeah, it's been great for just like opening that up for sure and opening up the willingness because it's not going to cost loads or, or impact the timing so much. Um, maybe they still don't trust the data, but they're definitely more open to actually running it and seeing what the output is, which is always good. So yeah, it's definitely helped. So what would be the biggest the biggest back the the factor that like clients love? Would that be speed, cost, quality, in, or let's say insights, depth of insights? So what would they choose from your point of view, experience? Is there any clients in the room that can answer this? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because they all like we yeah. want this next day uh, yeah. uh, for a really like low low cost but we want super niche and we want this and this so yeah. but you can only choose one or two maybe maybe so what mm. so what 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 are those from your experience um well obviously personally i would value the quality okay. but i actually think speed helps so much um in in you know clients being satisfied with with the work um but on, i guess the number one thing is just like the the impact and the recommendations i think 
that's the key thing that they value over anything. Like if you can show how it's helping them and how it's, as I said, sort of helping reach the goal of the research or driving that key decision, then I think ultimately like that's what's going to be the biggest like satisfier, I guess. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a really good question, actually. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I need to ask my clients, like, if you could choose one thing, <laughs> you, is it speed? Is it quality? Is it the depth? Like, yeah, yeah. maybe I'll go out and ask them that tomorrow. <laughs> it's like it's like the famous building question, or if you're ever having worked in, do you, you can have it, if you've got three ends of a triangle, you can have something cheap, you can have something fast, you can have something good. You can always have two, you can't have some, you can have something cheap and fast, it won't be good. Mm -hmm. You could have something good and fast, but it won't be cheap. So the same thing works for insight I think yeah. you just have to work out what the budget will go to yeah and, as you, and just being like in the, saying to them like you get what you pay for in yeah way, in a nicer way than that in a, in a friendlier version yeah. but still soft, it's soft that, yeah <laughs> okay so what are your clients or agency when you buy research you sort of want all the three elements of the triangle in a way but if there was anything else or a challenge beyond those three what do you think it is from this agency <laughs> perspective <Sorry. laughs> So it's from an agency perspective, buying research, what do you think is another sort of big challenge that you think you should be overcome or maybe that you face? Um, I think if it's if we're buying research for us, it's like because we want to know about external ex external external candidates and like the opinion of professional audiences and the difficulty we run into is just it being too niche of a sample to get a big enough sample within the budget the client the client has. So that's always a challenge. It's like this is how much time and money we, we have available to, to conduct the research. This is the audience, and suddenly it's become quite tricky and niche, which means we're gonna need a bit more time in the field, we're gonna need a bit more budget, you, we're gonna have to expand the, like, our approach to it. I think that can be a challenge, certainly in my field of employer branding and marketing, just like, if the, it can be, okay, we wanna talk to engineers that work in the mining and oil and gas company, and we wanna talk to a thousand of them or something. It's like, specific job functions, it's so like, well, Actually, we can't. We can reach two hundred. Like yeah. that's pretty good. That's robust. But they're like we wanted two thousand. You know, um, so that's the key thing looking for is, and that's why I partnered with Picatel just yeah. a little bit of you know um, promotion because they you were able to reach a very niche sample for us, and that was really helpful. So yeah, that's a key challenge. <laughs> Thank you. We have any more questions? Just adding to that. So what advice would you give to any client to get the most out of their research dollars spent? Um, oh, great question. Um, do you mean like in terms of if, so, so if they're coming to so me and saying... you were on the other side, and you've got a commission at agency. Yeah. What would, what would you, what, what, what would you do differently with commissioning someone like yourself to mm -hmm. do the research? Um, well, I would always try and, I guess, allow as much time as possible um, and not come to them, you know, with a tight deadline, but I know that's really difficult and it's, it's hard to do that. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I think I would just try to offer them, I guess, like a brief that makes sense for the timing that we have for the project. So if I know we've got a tight deadline, I'm not gonna come with unrealistic expectations and go, we need a really quick turnaround. Because I think what happens is if you're not familiar with research, you know, you do have unrealistic expectations. So I guess I would come to the agency with with that knowledge and say, look, I know what the limitations are, so I'm not going to suddenly just expect you to turn something around for a really new sample at half the cost. Like, um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else? Any more for any more? Okay. Are there any economies of scale you can apply to the research you've done already? Um, I work for an agency that does uh, financial, uh, specializes in financial services. A lot of the research we end up producing can be, it's for this client, but it, then it can be almost redirected to another client very easily because it ends up being the same mm -hmm. in and out and nothing much changes. Yeah, really. yes. But then the tricky thing with that is if, you know, if it's a research project that's been, you know, paid for by a client, then, you know, can you, you use it for? Yeah, no, <laughs> that's no, okay. not, not really. Um, <laughs> certainly, it can help you know us with our response to a client briefs because we know we've done research for another client. But in terms of actually using it for another client brief, then it gets a bit tricky. But it's funny in the world of like employee branding, you know, a lot of the findings are the same, but we can't necessarily use work that's been paid for by another client and taking it to a different one. So, so basically, you know 
the answer, but <laughs> you cannot <laughs> say to them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sometimes. <laughs> I <laughs> know, <laughs> but pay. I'm going to say that sometimes. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Definitely not. Good question. Though. Okay, are, are we done? Okay, I think we are. So thanks a lot for mm -hmm for being here on our first event and please let's just give a, a big clap to our to our to our speaker to today. Stick around we have a little bit wine more. We are, yeah. so we are doing great on that side and we plan to do second one January next year. So yeah please stay tuned and let's try and stay around.